Hello, my name is Matoy. I'm a senior here, as Gavin kindly mentioned. And today I'm going to talk to you about the oyster. Um, I don't know if any of you guys are as into oysters as I am, but this isn't just any oyster. This is the Pacific oyster. I'm going to talk to you about how sort of the oyster and me have a very tight history and why you should also be as interested in the Pacific oyster as I am. And really, it starts with this guy, Mr. Takeda. Uh, Mr. Takeda was um, my mentor, my boss, two summers ago at the Kaoku Shinpo uh, regional newspaper in northeastern Japan. And what he did was he taught me all about the history of the area, all about the beauty and the culture. And specifically, um, my research topic there was the 2011 tsunami. So um, sort of one of the most important events in recent Japanese history, definitely, probably, well, probably the most important event in recent northeastern Japanese history. So he was talking to me about this, the importance that it held for the people who lived in Japan, and sort of I was writing about it. Unfortunately, not in Japanese, and English, um, maybe one day. He took me to places like this. Um, this was an area that was inundated by the tsunami, an area where there used to be buildings. Now there are none. And um, he had me reflect on these areas, and that was very powerful. Um, he also took me to all sorts of other places as well, as well sometimes less morbid. This is the um, Millennium Hope Hills, the Senen Kibo no Oka. Um, it's an area where um, Japanese people had actually um, planted trees in the aftermath of the tsunami, not only to protect against future um, waves, but also sort of to create a sense of community and um, resilience in the face of disaster. So I had this experience. I saw all of these places, and I thought of the ocean. You know, Japan is a place that's surrounded by the ocean, and it's a thing that holds a very important sort of, it's a, it's a very important imaginary, I think, in Japanese life and Japanese culture in northeastern Japan. And sort of what that, how that all goes back to the oyster is this right here, sea pineapples. Now, sea pineapples, I don't know if you guys have had them. Um, Maria was actually saying, it's Maria, right? She was saying that she went to Korea. Apparently, it's a delicacy in Korea as well. Um, I had some raw um, sea pineapple or hoya in northeastern Japan, and it was, um, it was very interesting. You know, I, I, I first saw them. There's a picture. Oh, here's the picture. I saw this, and I was like, wow, um, this is a mango. You know, it's, it's sliced like a mango. I thought it was a weird way of eating a mango. It has the wasabi on the side. So I had some. And I'm, I was like, hmm, this is very interesting. <laughs> um, but it turns out, you know, it's actually, you have some more, and it's really tasty. And I don't know why, but that taste, it stuck with me. I was like, what is, is, are these hoya, all these sea pi pineapples all about? And why do all these wonderful people, they're wonderful, look at them. They're waving in the picture. That's Mr. Takeda right there. Why do they all love hoya so much? And it's sort of... What's something like that in America? So I came back to the America, and I was thinking, hmm, Hoya, Japan, what's something that we eat here? And of course, it's the oyster, the Pacific oyster. And it's the subject of my thesis. It's the reason that I went back to Japan again this summer, because it turns out the, the, Pacific, or, the Pacific or Japanese oyster is incredibly interesting. Because, you see, in the... In the early 20th century, the, the oyster, it started off in Japan, in Matsushima Bay, near the area I was, and it spread out all over the world. Um, oyster reefs were, being, were um, diminishing at the time, and now it, it's produced in all of these places, and eaten and even more. And it accounts for something like 90% of all oysters eaten today, so if any of you guys are having an oyster, it's probably a Pacific oyster. I, sort of, I started off with this fact, and I was like, wow, oysters. So I went back to Japan this most recent summer, again with the help of the Raishou Institute, to places like Japan. This is Tokyo, um, a place that many people have already said that they've been. It was great. I went to the archives there, the National Diet. I looked at lots of archives, people, talked to people. Um, I did lots of research on oysters. I also went to the Okayama area, which is another famous um, area of Japan for oyster production, perhaps not well as, as well known as Tokyo. Um, but here, I was able to sort of, again, talk to oyster fishermen, do some archival research, and sort of figure out my research project. And at the end of it all, I landed in Matsushima Bay, which is the area that I talked a little bit about earlier, but it's the place where all the oysters sort of spread out from Japan and went back all over the world. And I was like, wow, Matsushima Bay is amazing. I'm definitely going to write about this place. I'm going to write about Japan. 
Um, so I was doing all of this. I was really, I was looking for someone who was as interested in oysters as I was. And you know, I found him. Here he is, um, Mr. Hatakeyama Shigeyatsu, or oh, Mr. Shigeyatsu Hatakeyama. Um, he is the oyster man. He's called the grandfather of the sea in Japan. Apparently, a very famous oyster person. And his thing, like me, he's he's all about oysters. You know, he started this movement about the oysters and the forest and the environment. And it starts with these right here. You might recognize it. This is red tide, sort of um, so algal blooms that make the oceans red. And sort of the kitkake or the the reason that his movement started was that. Um, we have, when you're, when you're farming oysters and there are red tides, the oysters all go red because they take in all the redness. So people called them chigaki, they were blood oysters. No one would eat them and they were like, there's something wrong with the ocean. So, Mr. Hatakeyama decides to create the Moriwa Umi no Koibito, or the forest is the lover of the sea movement, where we all get together and by sort of preserving the ecology and planting trees and keeping the mountains all green and safe, we can also keep the oceans and the oysters well as well. And in this picture, you can sort of see it, but he's pointing to that mountain up there um, because that's the mountain where sort of nutrients flow down into the sea. So he showed me all this on, a, on his boat. He was a wonderful man. And um, he's sort of one of the areas of my thesis research. To bring this back to the US, there are also similar things happening here. The Billion Oyster Project in the New York is a way sort of to clean the ocean, but also I think it's, it's a way of thinking about the greater city as an environment and bringing everyone together through sort of clean resources. So um, I'm just going to quickly wrap this up again. I talked about Hoya, uh, sea pineapples. I talked about oysters. And now this is sort of the subject of my research. I ate these. I also ate these. They're both very tasty. I'd suggest that you eat both of them. And Remember that whenever you have an oyster, you're not only sort of eating the taste of the ocean, but you're also having a taste of Japan as well. Thank you very much. <laughs>